Hey everyone, welcome back. It's Tavis Leaf Glover, and today we're going to be covering The Shining. It's a movie by Stanley Kubrick. It's a horror movie, but I kind of seen it so many times that it's more like a dark comedy. It's Jack Nicholson's awesome in it, but it was recommended in the comments below, so make sure you guys leave a comment below. Let me know what you guys want to see next. And we're going to be covering color theory, a lot of design techniques, and just go through a lot of different scenes just to see what makes them so special. So many great compositions. I want to get into it right now. So we have a lot to go over and first I want to cover dynamic symmetry just so you get the idea of how Stanley shot it originally and how it was cropped. So the original ratio of the movie, the way Stanley shot it is 1.37 which is very close to the 4 thirds grid we see here. So the way you would compose each shot you'd use this grid on your screen and you'd line things up but Stanley shot it this way but then he anticipated it to be cropped to the wider format and in that case we use the root 3 grid. So I'm going to put up a clip to show you the difference but it's pretty cool and it's exciting for me because I've only recently seen it with this wider format but now I want to go back and watch the DVD that I have which is actually showing the 1.37 format which shows a little bit more headroom on the top and then the bottom and then that way we can see how Stanley composed it for both formats. There's a big controversy of what he composed it for because in the opening sequence you can see a helicopter shadow on the bottom part and then there's usually in some scenes there's more headroom on the top and the bottom but I'm gonna go through and look at the DVD for my own interests. I suggest you see both versions and try and just see how the composition looks with both of them. In this first scene I'm gonna show you with the four thirds grid. It's Danny riding his bike but you can see how much cooler these long hallways look with that 1.37 ratio and so this will be the grid on top of it. So I'll, I'll add a video and you can see what it looks like with the four third grid and also the root three grid. But I'm going to scroll through these real quick just so you can see how some of them line up with the root 3 grid. This is an opening scene, nice broke diagonal and sinister diagonal there. Nice hallway capturing these diagonals. So this, he uses one point perspective but you can see some diagonals locking in here. Horizontals locking in, verticals locking in. Another cool shot capturing these diagonals here. So you just line up this to your LCD or whatever and compose the shot with this root 3 grid on your screen. Another shot with her holding the bat. She's centered, but also the bat is paralleling this sinister diagonal. Another cool shot, one point perspective. Diagonal is locking in here, paralleling. Another shot, this is also separated shapes where these people are individually separated. We'll cover that more in a little bit. I'm just showing you really quick how these grids are lining up. So let's go into color. I wanna cover color because this is one of the biggest things that I notice is their attention to try and create color harmony and balance within each shot. These aren't really in order, but I'm going to show you a couple right off the bat. Is These two shots are similar, but we'll see how they change the color in each scene. So on the website, if you check out the website and you've been following it for a while, you know that I try and teach that the artist should try and incorporate four colors, which is red, green, yellow, and blue. And then you can have hue variations, which is like a purple, magenta, things like that. But you want to have it in a hierarchy, so kind of like when you're ordering a coffee, you want small, medium, or large, or extra large. You want those quantities of color within your shot. Well, let's start with this first one. This is in the beginning of the movie, and we see a lot of red. You notice all these red colors. So the set designer is actually placing objects to create the colors that they want in the scene. Notice Danny's wearing a blue and red jacket, blue jeans. He's wearing a blue coat. She's wearing neutral colors. These neutral colors match the neutral colors of the boxes also. But what we're noticing is a lot of red colors, right? some greens, we've got the blue, and then we've got some yellow right here, okay? Right up here and here. And then we switch over to this shot, you can see how they arranged it to have more greens. I don't know why, but it could be because he's wearing a red jacket, blue jeans, and then they're creating a hierarchy with way more green, all this green in the lettering, in these cans, some red right here, and then this was here before, and then more red over here. So when we switch back and forth, you can see the difference. More red, and then they're switching it to green. And it could be according to what the actor is actually wearing just to try and harmonize the whole scene. A little bit of yellow up here, see? Okay, so let's flip through these. Got another interesting shot. This one, we see her wearing green. Okay, the, they made her wear green for a reason, right? It's all part of the whole shot. So she's wearing green. We've got red up here, yellow's over here, 
and then blue on the right side. Got a little bit more yellow here. And then as the movie progresses, we'll see her running into the hallway, into this room, where we've got more green. She's wearing green. There's green here, but then there's also yellow. We've got some more red, some blue, and then more yellow here. So they're creating this hierarchy and matching the actor's clothing to try and complement the scene that's being set up. So right here, she runs to Jack, and she's wearing green. He's wearing blue, and then also red. And then in the background, we've got that yellow. So they're creating that balance and harmony in that shot. And it all plays out through that sequence. And I wanted to show you these. So this I edited some color into it and out of it. But we can see the blue in the posters here. Bone, got the red in the bell in the poster. And then the green over here, more red. Some yellow tones in the chairs right here. Okay, so we've got the four colors and there seems to be a hierarchy, right? A lot of like reddish, brownish colors, which could be considered neutral in areas. And then the blue and then the green. But as we cycle through, I'm gonna edit out the green. And we can see what the difference is with the scene. So with green and without, so it adds a little bit to there with the green. And these are probably like poker tables. People can, this is like the gaming room. People can come in here and play poker or whatever. And then here's a foosball table on the right and a cigarette machine probably. But so brown tables here, and then we're gonna change the green over to here, see how if it affects the balance of the image, which it doesn't really, but it definitely draws more attention to the left side than the right. And then here's green all around, kind of balances it from left to right, as well as the blue right here, with the blue poster on the right and the left, and then splits them down the middle of the frame here, who are also wearing a very, this is a variation of blue. We've also got blue in the handles of the foosball table. So that shows you the difference that the color will make in the scene, and it can be planned out just as they're doing in this movie. Okay, so let's cycle through the rest now that you know the concept of the color, and we'll see how they do it. So here we've got the red background, blue TV, yellow, and then the green sheets. So this is all planned. They could have had white sheets, which is really standard for any place, but we've got green now. We've got the red in the background, yellow lamp got more like variations of green and red in the curtains and then he's wearing blue so they're planning that whole shot the color of this shot with those four colors and trying to create a hierarchy of the colors right so I would say blue is probably the least amount of color here and then the red would be the most I would say because of the walls the green and then the yellow would be the least amount so that's small medium large and extra large if you want to think of it that way this shot see what she was wearing the green her shirts kind of yellowish in this shot it's actually like more of a tan but when it's surrounded by blue and this green it's kind of looking yellowish right she's wearing blue the background's blue and then she stops by this red vehicle here so they're planning these shots also got the green on the glass a lot of red uh, red plays a big part in this movie by the way just saying it's the color of blood obviously and we all know that cool shot of the elevators opening up and just a uh, ocean of red coming out of it pretty crazy looking more green red yellow and blue and Danny's wearing blue and red and then the background we've got the green up there bathroom is a variation of red it's pink Here's that shot with the red. What is that? Uh, strawberry fruit punch, probably. Super bright red. Every scene we've looked at before has red, green, yellow, and blue, right? Variations, and they're setting up the scene. Well, this look at this scene. It's all red. The red blood, the red doors. These are neutral colors. These are neutral colors, the, the seats. And then this tapestry up here is a neutral color. Very, very, very little green or color other than red. So they're setting up this scene to look completely red as much as possible. Here we got more variations, yellow, blue, red, and we're just missing that green color. A little bit of green by his hand and in the dartboard. But you'll notice how red is playing a part, right? They could have had blue darts, but red, they chose red darts, okay? Red's a huge factor in this movie. So who's leading the group right here? This guy, right? What do they dress him in? Red pants. So everybody's following the red. And what does the scene look like? They're surrounded by green. He's wearing a yellow jacket, and then the car is blue on the left. So we can see how they're planning this around colors. I'm outlining a new writing project. And this scene, he's getting a sense of the shining, right? The eerie music is rising up, and then they surround him all by red. Look at all this red. And then, But we've got a splash of green, yellow, and then he's wearing blue. You've got a dozen jugs of black molasses. We've got 60 boxes of dry milk. Right here, we're surrounded by green. She's wearing red and blue. This shot is pretty cool because he's sitting there by himself. He's wearing green and he's with the, the red, right? And then the yellow, but 
they're missing Blue. So what they do is she walks up from the long hallway into the, the room he's sitting in, and sh to complete the color, she's wearing blue. So that's pretty cool. In this shot, she's wearing yellow, a little bit of red. Got blue in the postcards here, red in the background, green in the book here. So you can see that this stuff is all planned out. He's wearing a blue sweater, got the red, splash of green, just missing that little bit of yellow. And of all the colors we've looked at, they're all basically, you know, the primary colors with green. Everything looks pretty normal, but for room 237, the weirdest room in the whole hotel, look at these colors. They're using green with purples, and these other variations of purple and pink, and then lots of stripes and crazy patterns. So isn't that weird how they're saving this weird color for the weirdest room, right? And then the room that he goes into, the bathroom is green with yellow. All this is planned, maybe to affect you psychologically or just to complement the scene, but this one's definitely, the, the room 237 is definitely planned to look weird and give you that weird feeling, especially the way they film it and all that. Here's another one, blue lights. He's wearing, could be wearing white, but it's reflecting the blue colors. He's talking on a red phone. Yellow's in the background with a lamp, and then we've got this tree with green on the left. This one, he's walking up, and he stops right in front of this green tapestry. He's wearing red and blue. Hallway, of course, they splash a little bit of green in there, surrounded by red. We're just missing blue here. And the liquid he spills on him is yellow. He's wearing a red coat, but he spills yellow on him. We've got the green on the right side here in the background. And then we've got the blue jeans down here. Interesting, right? We got this. Of all the colors of the any car that could be crashed here, it's a red one. And then of any color that of hat they could be wearing, it's red. So that's just showing you the, the way red is a major player in this movie. We've got this red shirt underneath his robe surrounded by the yellow background there this one's pretty cool that's a reflection from the hallway she's wearing the green dragging his yellow boots his blue jeans and then we've got the splash of red with the fire extinguisher this one they had that green light on the left side surrounded by red and then he's wearing blue there floor is yellow this one she's running through the hallway they put green bottles on the left here got lots of red here in the pipes and then also blue pipes to complete that color scheme that they're going for got yellow here on the left side here with these little swatches She's running through the hallway. It's a red hallway, but of course they add splashes of green on the left and right with those tables. And then she's wearing blue. Also got yellowish colors here in the lights. Same with this shot. This one actually is creating a triangular shape with the knife going up to the light and then going down the chairs here. Okay, we'll go to the next one. These are just random techniques that I noticed that are pretty cool to point out. This one is an establishing shot. A lot of uh, movies do this just to let you know where it's taking place. We've got cool clouds, which could have been computerized, but it's creating that aerial perspective, the depth. I've actually went here, Mount Hood, and it's really, really small inside, not even close to being what is represented in the movie. I think they just used the outside of this as the location and then they filmed it all in London, but I'm not 100% sure on that. So this scene when they're talking back and forth, it's really close up shots of their faces, but then Danny has a line that says, is this place dangerous? And they, they create this shot, right? And it's got the knives in the background. So the only time they show this shot is when he says, is this place dangerous? So it's just an interesting psychological thing that they're creating. Dralon. Are you scared of this place? No. These are some cool cross-dissolve shots that I noticed as they fade from one scene to the next. <laughs> that one's pretty cool. This one's the greatest area of contrast where he raises the knife to create a silhouette in front of the lamp and then he feels the sharpness in front of the lamp so it's directing our eyes right towards that knife. This is a cool perspective where they have the camera really close to where he's chopping and almost as he's chopping through the door it's slightly shaking the camera. It's a really cool perspective, so I made note of that one. This one we see a circular motion going around her arm, around the books in the background, around this telephone wire, and then back to her arm going around. So they designed the background to have that movement and flow. This one, when she's running up the stairs, creating interesting shadow shapes, these repeating shapes, and it adds to that feeling where it's actually like someone's behind her, chasing her, but it's just her shadow. And then it ends on this cool shot where the shadows are reflected on the wall and the crazy weird teddy bear guy in the middle. This one right here is going to be seen in separated shapes but also I wanted to point out say if you're a photographer and you wanted to create illusions or avoid illusions this is adhering to gestalt psychology principles and I want to show you this. So if this is a photo it'd be kind of a bad photo because what we see here on the right side is 
could be something, an illusion of what's going on, which is definitely not what's going on. So you want to avoid things like that, but in a movie it doesn't matter. But I just wanted to point that out, it's pretty funny. So let's go on to the other ones. We'll flip through these real quick. You should, if you've been watching videos or if you're a member on the site, you should know all these techniques by heart. But uh, I want to point these out as it's portrayed in the movie. So we've got aerial perspective where you're reducing the contrast and creating more depth in the scene. So we've got a nice foggy scene with the lights shining through it. In reality, there might not be someone driving behind him, but for this car's silhouette to show up, you need a light behind there to illuminate and create that silhouette shape. And then also we've got the shape of the person inside with the mirror. But without light behind the car, we wouldn't have this same cool shot. This one, we've got lens flare, reducing the contrast around his head. His facial expressions are pretty funny. This one, more aerial perspective, more clouds here. Just awesome shots all around. More aerial perspective. This one, smoke can be considered aerial perspective. It's creating that smoke like a foggy day and then also reducing the contrast in certain areas. And then we've also got the lens flare from the window. Same with this one, lens flare. This is cool. The snow's piled up so high that it's she's trying to climb out the window and Danny's down here waiting for her. Same with this one, more aerial perspective. This is cool where they have him centered in the shot in the maze. Nice foggy night with him moving around in front of the light. Creates these cool lighting effects. That's aerial perspective. Aspect of view is important. This one they have him crawl out and have him spread his limbs as he's kind of crab walking sideways. So we can see that cool silhouette shape. It's also weird looking. This shot with the axe. They want him carrying the axe to create an aspect of view so we can identify it with a silhouetted shape. Same with this one, creating that aspect of view. This one, he's actually walking away from room 237 and he's doing that kind of Danny crab walk backwards. His limbs are spread here, see his arms? And then he kind of walks backwards towards the hallway and exits. But you can see his shadows kind of cool looking because he's walking with an aspect of view. So that's aspect of view. These are all centered shots. As mentioned before, Stanley Kubrick liked the one point perspective. So he centered a lot of his shots and had the diagonals broke and sinister kind of heading towards the center area. But we've got this cool shot centered and these will all look different on the DVD. So be sure to check it out because there's going to be more room on the top and bottom. We'll see that full composition that Stanley Kubrick filmed it in. I like this shot where he starts close up to the typewriter and slowly pans out to see that just Jack's a big slacker. He's not doing his job. Cigarettes burned down right here. P newspapers and stuff in the background. Everything's kind of a mess and then he pans further back and Jack's just throwing a ball on the wall. Kind of uh, being a slacker writer. Here's that shot I was talking about where Wendy walks up wearing blue to create the color but we've got this nice centered shot here, nice balance. This is a cool shot, centered, completing that color theory that we were talking about with the blue sweater, the green shirt, and then Jack is centered in the background. That's a really cool shot. This is centered, saw that one. This one's centered, that one. This one's a cool shot, centered, creating that portal looking, it's like a frame within a frame. This one's centered, another cool centered shot showing the silhouette, aspect of view of the axe. There's the centered ones. Another important thing if you're a photographer, cinematographer, is to show different perspectives. So get high or get low and show the viewer something different to look at, something different than eye level. So here's Stanley lower and shooting up towards Wendy, showing her the panic on her face. This is cool, he's low down on the ground, showing Jack in pain and trying to get up real quick. This one, he's high up in the frame and Jack's a little tiny element. This is a cool shot where she walks up on the typewriter and sees that he's just goofing off and not working. Another cool perspective, down low, down low on this one. This is an awesome shot, down low, probably in between his legs. I think he is lying down on the ground in between Jack's legs and filming upward. <laughs> Very good, Jack. Excellent. Right, check the gate, Doug. So there's some really cool shots. Always try and mix up the perspective. Change your elevation there. These are counterparts where if you split the composition down the center, you have nice balance on the left and right because there's interest on both sides. You got Danny talking to him, his friend Tony. Also notice the colors, red, blue, yellow, and the shower curtain, and then this green bottle down here. You got this counterpart here, another one. It's another cool one. Two weapons split down the middle. This one too, split down the middle there. And then he's looking at the radio. Another cool one. Danny acts as a fulcrum of two interest points the red rum on the door and then his mom sleeping. It's another cool shot where he just peeks in. So in this shot, it's weird how he doesn't go all the way in the room, but it's tied into one of the conspiracies, which actually is relating to this 
picture on the wall of bears but if you know about the conspiracies of this movie then maybe you'll agree with that he's he doesn't want to go into the room he's just kind of peeking into it but they use the counterpart there this is a really cool shot nice counterpart jack's sitting there and then danny and wendy sitting there on the left another one, cool counterpart here these reflections in the ceiling direct our eyes right to lloyd the bartender a little slow tonight isn't it Another cool fulcrum, she's in the center, but then we've got the lock on the left and then the knives on the right. So that's counterpart. Definitely mirrors play a part, just like the colors and the red colors. Everything Stanley does, he's he was a big chess player, so he's probably 10 steps ahead of everybody watching his movies. But this is a really cool mirror shot. Nice balance too. As Jack's walking down this hallway, you can see the reflection of him in the mirrors on the wall on the left side here. Very spooky feeling. This is a adheres to the law of symmetry. Mirrored lake. Really cool shot. It's another cool mirror shot. Split down the middle. Nice counterpart. Colors. Lots of stuff. Another mirror shot here with room 237. This is a good mirror shot right here. See the reflection on the right? <laughs> this one's gross. Classic mirror shot. Another one. Very cool stuff. You got the rear view mirror. On this one this one which reveals what red rum means murder so you can see how the mirrors play a huge part as well as the colors of red everything this one is separated shapes you can see how all the characters are separated we can see even this guy on the left in the background this woman sitting in the chair she's separated this guy standing here he's separated so very cool shot everything's organized separated shapes here you can see each character clearly and then this one i told you about everybody's separated Pretty well and then the last one is figure on relationship so this is a really important technique where you just want the figure to fit into the background nicely so this is a classic shot where she's got dark hair and then they find the pocket of light space to portray her subject nicely there's no visual confusion same with this one they find the pocket so this is planned it's not just happenstance that he's just standing in the perfect spot you know another interesting thing is you know figure on relationship the abbreviation for that is fgr so i call this one fgr reversal where you're actually focused on the back and the foreground is blurred right they still have to play together they have to still have to tie together but the interest is focused on the background instead of the foreground in most cases so this is a really cool shot where she's blurred out but she's focusing on what is happening in the background kind of gives us her perspective what she's seeing and puts us in her shoes especially the way Kubrick gets really close to the actors see how close we are to her she's all blurred out we're up pretty much on her sleeve and we're seeing her drag Jack in there and we see that in a lot of shots where it just kind of puts us in their shoes so you can do that with photography too you can do that in your paintings doesn't matter but it, it's definitely a cool effect and puts us more into their character this one's a really cool shot where Danny's coming out of hiding and he's about to run away from Jack this one really cool shot that's so putting us in their shoes this creepy shot the girls standing there another really cool FGR reversal where Danny's blurred out but they're focused on Wendy and Jack this one's a really cool figure ground relationship shot where they're focused on this snow cat but they have this little pocket of white space and we see the silhouette of her running within it very cool shot another cool one where he creeps around the corner here and he's blurred out but we're focused on Wendy really cool creepy shot how do you like it that's what he says how do you like it? <laughs> Such a, I've, I've seen this so many times that, and I view Jack as a slacker, loser, nobody that abuses his wife verbally and abuses his son physically. And he's just a big loser, goofs around, he's a drunk. And I've seen this so many times that that's kind of the psychology of this character. He's just kind of a big loser and he fails with Grady. Grady's the ghost. You a uh, married man, are you, Mr. Grady? He's bested by his wife and his son. He's such a loser, he can't even outwit and kill his family the way Grady wants him to. So he begs and cowers to Grady, and he fails at that. Just give me one more chance to prove it, Mr. Grady. That's all I ask. He's outsmarted by Danny in the maze. That's how kind of dumb he is. He's a really shallow person, but that's my take on him. But it's he plays this character amazingly with his facial expressions and the dialogue and the actions that he takes. All ties into his perfect character. So you see right here, we're really close to her. Nice figure on relationship reversal there. 
basically like we're in her shoes. Another cool shot. So those are all figure on relationship reversals. We pretty much covered everything. So that's it for this one. Hope you guys enjoyed that. And be sure to check out the site. I talk about all these techniques. And then also I've got tons of videos on here that you can enjoy. And take notes, apply it to your art, and hopefully this will help you create better compositions and create more interesting shots in your work. Huge thanks for all the support. I really appreciate you guys. And I will talk to you later.